It's time now for one more thing, Juan. Well, absence makes the heart grow fonder. You know that old saying. Doesn't it? Well, yes, it does, love. So take a look at this video, folks. Anybody? <laughs> So let me explain. That's a one-year-old monkey, Limbani, and he's being reunited with the two people who raised him after he was left to die from pneumonia by Aww. his monkey mom. <laughs> the, that little chimp survived and now lives at the Zoological Foundation of Miami. The two humans who raised him, Tanya and George, had not seen him for a few months, but at the sound of their voices and the sight of them, you can see that Limbani was full of hugs and snuggles and even buried his head and nuzzled into his father's shoulder. Nothing beats love, even across the species. <laughs> well written, Juan. I especially like monkey love. Wow. So if Greg were here, if only Greg were here. Okay, monkey Kimberly. Monkey love. Monkey love. All right. <laughs> yes. Okay, so this is um, U.S. Marine officer, a veteran, retired DEA agent, and fitness director, George Hood, and he set two new world records for the plank in 24 hours. The first record was for the longest continuous plank. He held a plank for 10 hours and 10 minutes. And oh. the second was for a most cumulative plank time in a 24-hour period with a total time of 18 hours and 10 minutes done in 13 <laughs> sets. This is so savage. I find it very attractive. Um, <laughs> his incredible record were part of a fundraising effort, and he raised money for the YMCA of Metro Chicago's Urban Warriors Program. And this is a program that connects veterans to youth who have been exposed to violence, and there's a lot of that in the Chicago area. So, and guess how many calories? You can eat all the barbecue you want. 7,000 calories Wait, I don't burn. even see how that's possible. He's like a superhuman, Dana. Okay, I'm, Natural I'm, I'm selection impressed. With I was selection, complaining yes. about a three-minute the other day. Yeah. Three. I, I can I do it. two. I did three. Wow. But I'm not that as heavy as you. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I mean, you're like skinny. But I mean, oh no. I mean, you're perfect. He Tom, burns the way a lot you are. But I get to go next. Okay. Sports. So last week, the Lieutenant Colonel Daniel E. Holland Memorial Military Working Dog Hospital. That's a mouthful, but it is in San Antonio. It opened a new wing with expanded space for post-operative patients and aquatic therapy rooms. Deb uh, M. WD is the only hospital in the U.S. military working dogs injured in the line of duty can go to. The injured dogs come from all over the world, from military duty stations and war zones, like in Afghanistan and Iraq, and they receive cutting edge care. And the hospital can house anywhere between 700 to 900 dogs at a time. This is how important these dogs are to us and to our safety. And once a month, all of them line up inside the hospital for their checkups. And uh, that's a process that Lieutenant Colonel Jackie Parker calls organized chaos which sounds <laughs> quite amazing but congratulations to them and their new hospital wing yeah perfect all right tom okay if you're a kid and you make a mistake you can do two things you can stand your ground and make an excuse or you can do what noah did check it out he broke a watermelon and he he bolted he <laughs> I mean, he just walked away for a second. I don't know. I, if I know Noah, he was out the store. <laughs> he was out the door, and you know, he hit the highway. He's looking for the camera, video yeah. camera. He's like, oh, I know. He's like, little does he know, is someone, somebody there was ratting him out. All right, Jason. The good folks at Heber Valley Artisan Cheese are making a Chaffetz cheese. Yes, there's going to be a new cheese. It's the jalapeno honey nut that we're working on. And we had a really good taste tester come by yesterday. None other than Mitt Romney, who's decided to step back and go check it out. He's look, check, checking out the Chaffetz cheese there. He gave it a little taste test, gave it a thumbs up to try to figure out how long it should age. And I do hope I can come back to the five at some point and we'll sample some Chaffetz cheese. Yeah, I was going to ask. You, well, where is it? Don't, we it's want right it. there. They're still. It's got to get to just the right age, and then we'll bring it in. Have a well, little jalapeno. How long jalapeno. is that going to take? Like how well, much we're jalapeno? Pretty close. We're like getting a lot gloves? of jalapeno. It's just the right amount. Just, just, just the It might the be perfect for amount. Kimberly's food court. Just saying. Okay. Yeah. You can audition for it. Are, are, are you an investor? Yeah. Are it's, you an investor? It's all jalapeno yes, business. This is great. Oh, oh. Doug, yeah, remember? Yes. yes, I do. All right. Thanks for joining us as we kick off the Independence Day holiday. We had a lot of fun. Tune in tomorrow for our Fourth of July special. It's a fan mail uh, whole show, so don't miss it. But now, special report is up next. Hey, John. Hi, Dana. Thank you. This is a Fox News alert.
Welcome to Washington. I'm John Scott in for Brett Baer tonight. President Trump expected to make remarks at a military salute to service charity dinner within the hour. We will take you there live when he does, because while we expect him to thank veterans for their service, we also wonder whether he might hint at some of the other big issues facing his administration, including new details about who he's interviewing for the Supreme Court. It's a list that now includes a sitting senator. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts joins us from the North Lawn with details. John, good evening. John, good evening to you. The White House has been tight-lipped about the interview and selection process, but it appears tonight that President Trump is nearing the end of his search. President Trump left Washington for West Virginia today with no comment about the search for a Supreme Court nominee. But the White House tells Fox News the president spoke with three more candidates today. Sources say they include appellate court judges Joan Larson and Thomas Hardiman and Utah Senator Mike Lee, bringing to seven the total number of candidates the president has interviewed to replace Justice Kennedy. Despite critics charge that President Trump is seeking to overturn Roe versus Wade, the White House insists there is no litmus test. The main thing the president is looking for uh, are people that fit uh, the, the, the qualifications that you would want in a Supreme Court justice. Uh, tremendous intellect, someone who will stick to upholding the Constitution, and somebody who has great judicial temperament. The White House is also only too happy to chum the waters of speculation surrounding the president's pick. This afternoon, confirming the president's phone conversation with Senator Lee. Lee told Fox News, I thought it went well, very hard to predict. Sources involved in the selection process tell Fox News it's highly unlikely Lee would become the next Supreme Court justice. But White House officials were amused to watch stories of Lee's possible elevation to the Supreme Court catch fire. As the president searches for the next Supreme, he is also engaging the Supreme Leader of North Korea. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo will travel to Pyongyang on Thursday. The White House has refused to confirm reports that North Korea is making improvements to several uranium enrichment sites, which would appear to contradict Kim's promise to dismantle his nuclear program. I'm not going to confirm or deny intelligence reports. I'm not going to comment on that. Uh, but we had good meetings just a couple days ago. And the goal is, is the same as it's always been, and that's denuclearization. That's what we're going to continue pushing for and continue working with them on. Again this week, President Trump said the deal with North Korea could fall apart, but he remains optimistic optimistic, tweeting, if not for me, we would now be at war with North Korea. While that statement may be open to debate, the president's tough stance on immigration has found some unlikely company. German Chancellor Angela Merkel narrowly avoided the breakup of her government by implementing new border controls. We have found a good compromise after tough negotiations and difficult days. Merkel's liberal immigration policies were the target of frequent attacks by President Trump. Trump. The German people are going to riot. The German people are going to end up overthrowing this woman. I don't know what the hell she's thinking, but they have millions of people pouring into Germany, and now they're not stopping them. Today, Press Secretary Sarah Sanders dodged a question whether the president feels vindicated by Merkel's about face. The president's focused on uh, trying to fix the immigration problem we have here in the United States. He'd like to see Congress, particularly Democrats, uh, stop political grandstanding and actually come up with some real solutions and work with us to fix the problem. What are the chances of getting an immigration reform bill? To quote Muhammad Ali, slim to none and slim just left town. And with Congress expected to be consumed by the upcoming nomination of a Supreme Court replacement, there may be little oxygen on Capitol Hill left for anything else. John? John Roberts at the White House. Thank you. The Trump administration announced this afternoon it is reversing an Obama-era policy that encouraged colleges to consider race during the college admissions process. Correspondent Garrett Tenney reports tonight on what brought them to this decision. Today, the Justice Department announced it's getting rid of Obama-era guidelines intended to promote diversity by using race in college admissions decisions. The guidelines from 2011 and 2016 laid out legal recommendations for schools looking to use affirmative action. Trump's DOJ argues that the Obama administration's guidance isn't legally sound and goes beyond Supreme Court precedent on that issue. Rescinding the guidelines doesn't change the law, but supporters of the move hope it pushes colleges to change. It 
will be one more step in discouraging universities and colleges from using race and ethnicity as a criteria for admissions. That should not be happening in America in the year of 2018. Attorney General Jeff Sessions has now rescinded dozens of guidance documents issued by the Obama administration after launching a review last year. DOJ determined a lot of the Obama era policies were inconsistent with the Constitution, saying today the executive branch cannot circumvent Congress or the courts by creating guidance that goes beyond the law and in some instances stays on the books for decades. But critics suggest this reversal is a politically motivated attack on affirmative action. All across this country, we're seeing a coordinated um, series of attacks on race conscious policies in the higher ed context. It sends the wrong message to administrators and college presidents all across our country that are working hard to ensure diversity on their campuses. The Supreme Court last held that affirmative action was constitutional in 2016. The deciding vote in that case was Justice Anthony Kennedy, who in his opinion, left the door open to future legal challenges. And with his retirement, it's just another example of how his successor is expected to have a major impact on the court for years to come. John? Garrett Tenney, thank you. Well, President Trump wants NATO countries to pay their fair share for defense and is making demands of several NATO leaders and allies ahead of next week's summit in Brussels to do just that. National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin has our report from the Pentagon. In a series of letters that became public after they were sent to European leaders, both President Trump and his defense secretary, Jim Mattis, have warned the U.S. is losing patience with NATO allies not pulling their weight in defense expenditure. A June 12th letter from Mattis to his British counterpart warned Britain could forfeit its special relationship with the U.S. if it does not spend more. All of this a week before a NATO summit in Brussels amidst threats from President Trump to pull U.S. troops out of Europe and shutter bases in Germany if it does not meet its NATO obligations. The United States puts uh, over four and a half percent of the GDP into NATO. And he wants other countries to step up. They have a commitment to meet the two percent threshold. The U.S. actually spends closer to 3.5 percent of its GDP on defense, still far more than the other 28 NATO allies. Britain is one of just four nations currently spending more than two percent of their GDP. For President Trump, it has become a rallying cry. We're the piggy bank that they like to take from. Germany is paying 1% of a much smaller GDP. Now, that doesn't work, folks. Doesn't work. So I think we should pay the same as Germany. Former Defense Secretary Robert Gates raised the issue in 2011. Future U.S. political leaders those for whom the Cold War was not the formative experience that it was for me, may not consider the return on America's investment in NATO worth the cost. President Bush and Obama both pressed NATO allies to pay their fair share, estimated at 2% of GDP. President Obama famously referred to some as free riders. Going forward, every NATO member state must step up and carry its share of the burden by showing the political will to invest in our collective defense. The allies agreed to ante up by 2024. While Pentagon officials agree NATO countries should spend more, former top U.S. commanders who served in Europe warn it would be a colossal mistake for President Trump to pull out the 32,000 U.S. troops currently in Germany, suggesting it would simply be a win for Russia. John? Jennifer Griffin at the Pentagon, thanks. For the short trading day ahead of the holiday, the Dow dropped 132, the S&P 500 lost 13, and the Nasdaq finished down 65. As Americans hit the road for the holidays, the average price of a gallon of regular gasoline, $2.86, the highest level for the July 4th period in four years, but still about 10 cents less than a month ago. Republican Congressman Jim Jordan is facing accusations of ignoring allegations of sexual abuse by a teen doctor at The Ohio State University. Three former wrestlers told NBC News that it was common knowledge that Richard Strauss inappropriately touched players during appointments. Now Congressman Jordan was assistant wrestling coach at the university from 1986 to 1994 and is denying any knowledge of that abuse. 
His spokesperson is saying today Congressman Jordan never saw any abuse, never heard about any abuse, and never had any abuse reported to him during his time as a coach at Ohio State. He has not been contacted by investigators about the matter, but will assist them in any way they ask because if what is alleged is true, the victims deserve a full investigation and justice. Male athletes from 14 sports at the university have reported alleged sexual misconduct by Strauss. Strauss died in 2005. 12 boys and a coach are no longer alone in a flooded cave they've been trapped in for more than a week. Today, seven members of the Thai Navy SEALs, including a doctor, joined them in the cave. But as senior foreign affairs correspondent Greg Palcott Pal Pal reports, even as rescuers make it in, they still face challenges in getting them out. How to get these kids out of a mile deep cave in northern Thailand. That's the challenge facing rescue teams now. We're coming. It's okay. It's okay. Many people are coming. The boys, aged 11 to 16, and their 25 year old coach have been practicing soccer some 10 days ago when they decided to explore a nearby cave. Heavy rains flooded the cave, trapping them deep underground. After days of frantic searching by Thai and international teams of rescue workers and divers, including U.S. military service members from Japan, they were found alive. I have to thank the international community in assisting us. This would not have been possible if we didn't help each other. The 13 are said to be in stable condition. They've been living off water dripping from the cave walls, but they'd had nothing to eat. We have given the boys food, starting with easily digested and high-protein food with enough minerals. Still, getting those trapped out is a challenge. Waiting for flooding to recede or drilling a tunnel could take months. With more rains forecast, officials are considering assisting those trapped to dive their way out with special breathing gear. Also very tricky. Once the cave floods seriously again, with the amount of water going through in the current and the visibility in the water, it may be that diving operations will become impossible. For now, family and friends who had been waiting vigil are happy their loved ones are alive. A telephone line is being strung through the cave so they can communicate. When you think about such a problem set, when the outcomes could have been far worse, and to have like such a miracle story, I don't see how you couldn't be, you know, believing in uh, humanity. For now, rescue teams continue to pump out water from the cave to keep the boys alive and to keep hope alive that this miracle story ends up well. John. Greg Palka. Thanks, Greg. A former IT aide to congressional Democrats has pleaded guilty to bank fraud. Imran Awan pleaded guilty to making a false statement on an application for a home equity loan. Awan once worked for Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, among other lawmakers, and was investigated for a possible cyber breach. Investigators determined federal charges were not warranted in that probe. Well, Congress sets another date with FBI agent Peter Strzok over his anti-Trump texts. This as a Senate panel announces that it agrees Russia preferred a Trump rather than a Clinton presidency. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge joins us live with more. Catherine, good evening. Well, thanks, John, and good evening. The Senate Intelligence Committee released an unclassified report backing up the controversial 2017 intelligence assessment that found Russia wanted to damage candidate Hillary Clinton, harm her electability, and over time, the Russian government developed a clear preference for Donald Trump. When the report was released in 2017, there was some daylight between the NSA, then led by Admiral Mike Rogers, the FBI, then led by Director James Comey, and the CIA, then led by Director John Brennan, over the key finding. Senate investigators interviewed analysts and concluded the differences were not politically motivated. The Senate report also confirmed opposition research compiled by former British spy Christopher Steele and paid for by the DNC and Clinton campaign did not play any role in the 2017 assessment because the information was considered unverified. In a separate development, a federal judge ordered special counsel lawyers and former National Security Advisor Mike Flynn to appear in a D.C. court on July 10th after both sides asked for more time putting off Flynn's sentencing for a third time. Flynn supporters emphasize new information has come to light since the December guilty plea, pointing to a Republican-drafted congressional report that found former Deputy FBI Director Andrew McCabe and FBI Director James Comey told Congress their agents found no signs of deception during Flynn's interview about his Russian contacts. Legal analysts are warning against jumping to any conclusions.
it's kind of tough to unring that bell at this point. I mean, because Flynn has stood up in court. He has said he lied. He has said the circumstances of the lie. If he undid it, it all goes away. His protection goes away on everything else as well as on this one count. The House Judiciary Committee also issued a subpoena today for FBI agent Peter Strzok to publicly testify on the 10th. Strzok is one of two agents who interviewed Flynn. John. Catherine Herridge. Thanks, Catherine. You're welcome. Up next, stories from the border from Texas to Israel. But first, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 40 in Sacramento, where firefighters are still trying to get the upper hand over a massive wildfire in sparsely populated areas in the northwest of the city. That fire has grown to 109 square miles. Fox 25 in Boston, where the governor is hoping to get guns out of the hands of people considered a danger to themselves or others. The so-called red flag measure will allow a relative or someone else with close ties to a legal gun owner to petition a court for a 12-month extreme risk protection order if the individual was exhibiting dangerous or unstable behavior. The gun owner is allowed to appeal the decision. And take a live look at St. Louis from Fox 2. The big story there tonight, the reopening of the famous Gateway Arch. The arch is back open after undergoing five years of renovations to make the National Monument more accessible. And that is tonight's live and rainy look outside the Beltway from Special Report. To speak to military members this Right now, we are awaiting President Trump's remarks at the Salute to Service dinner in West Virginia. But first, his EPA administra administrator, Scott Pruitt, is denying reports that he personally asked the president to fire Attorney General Jeff Sessions and let him run the Justice Department. Pruitt told Fox News that the story is, quote, 100 percent false. However, just a short time ago, a White House spokesman told reporters the president is looking into the reports that he calls troublesome. He added that the president has been very concerned about reports of possible ethics violations by Administrator Pruitt. A federal court is blocking the Trump administration's zero tolerance policy toward immigration, saying it must stop putting legitimate asylum seekers in detention. Correspondent Casey Stiegel with what this means for one border crossing in El Paso. In response to a joint lawsuit filed by the ACLU and others, a federal judge has determined at least five ICE field offices around the country were not affording asylum seekers their full rights. Judge James Bosberg states, this opinion does no more than hold the government accountable to its own policy, which recently has been honored more in the breach than the observance. So he issued a temporary injunction ordering ICE to stop what the suit calls arbitrary detention of legitimate asylum seekers. The court points out long before enforcement of the zero tolerance policy began, directives were already in place on how to handle asylum cases. Fear screenings are given to those individuals to see if there's credible evidence they are indeed fleeing persecution in their home countries. If they pass, they're eligible for humanitarian release, so they're not detained as their case winds through the courts. The ruling came down as a delegation of top leaders within the Catholic Church traveled to the border in Brownsville, Texas. But we also have to be worried about the human voice, face, and lives of those who come to us because they're so fearful of where they live. The bishops met with law enforcement, prayed with those in custody, and even held mass. And while they praised the work of HHS, federal agents, and everyone they'd met with, they also urged people to look at this as a humanitarian issue, not a political one. When you have the opportunity to sit down with a family, uh, liberal labels and conservative labels melt away. Back out here live on the Texas-Mexico border tonight, the White House has pointed to smugglers and violent criminals who also try and claim asylum. In other words, exploiting the system since they knew in the past it could potentially make them eligible for earlier release. It's not clear tonight if the DOJ will fight this latest injunction. John. Casey Stiegel in El Paso. Thanks. On another border, Syria's neighbors to the south are not accepting refugees even as they continue to crowd along the borders of Israel and Jordan to escape the deadly civil war there. 
But as chief correspondent Jonathan Hunt reports from Israel, despite keeping refugees out, they are not leaving them high and dry. The Syrian refugees keep coming, and more tents go up daily to provide them shelter from the searing heat at their encampment on the Israeli border and on the border with Jordan, which says it cannot take any more refugees, having admitted one million since 2011. Israel, too, says it will not open its border because Israel suspects rebels are among the refugees. But like Jordan, Israel is delivering tons of aid. We were along Inside one of the aid trucks heading to the border last night under cover of darkness for security. Corn, bread, other foodstuffs is going to go under military escort. And here's how the aid drops work along this sensitive border. The Israeli army opens up a section of the fence and then the food, medicines and other supplies are dropped on the Syrian side. The Israeli army then closes up that section and pulls back. It is only then that Syrians are allowed to move up to the fence, take the aid and start handing it out to the refugees. The flow of refugees is driven by the march of Syrian government troops. In this video provided by the Syrian government, soldiers shout their allegiance to President Bashar al-Assad as they apparently retake control of towns in southwestern Syria previously held by the rebels against whom the government has fought this seven-year civil war. And as Syrian forces continue their operations largely unimpeded, it is clear that the major powers involved, the US, Russia and Israel, all decided some time ago that it is in their best interests for President Assad to stay in power for now. There are obvious risks in that policy, but it is based on the simple calculation, better the devil you know. John? Our chief correspondent, Jonathan Hunt. Thanks. Up next, another Obamacare checkup as health care premiums price thousands out of the market. First, beyond our borders tonight, the former prime minister of Malaysia is under arrest in connection with a theft and money laundering investigation. Najib Razak's arrest comes during a probe into a $10.6 million transfer to Najib's bank account. At least five people were hurt when a pedestrian bridge collapsed at a Mumbai train station during heavy rains. The concrete slab fell onto empty train tracks, damaging part of the platform roof and electrical system. And in France, Greenpeace activists say they crashed a drone and a radio-controlled plane into a French nuclear plant to highlight the lack of security around the facility. The group released a video showing the crash into the tower they say the aircraft were harmless, but demonstrate the lax nuclear security in France. Just some of the other stories beyond our borders tonight. Back in this country, we are waiting for President Trump to take the stage in West Virginia for his remarks at a salute to service dinner on this, the day before Independence Day. We'll be right back. Fox News alert and President Trump has arrived at the Greenbrier Resort in West White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, where he will address the military at the salute to service dinner. We will take you there live when the president takes the stage. Well, despite promises that it would be affordable, Obamacare premiums have skyrocketed. And according to a new government report, those spikes priced about a million people out of the health insurance market last year. In tonight's Obamacare checkup, correspondent Peter Ducey with a look at just how high costs have risen. More than a million Americans decided to drop health insurance coverage last year once policy changes dictated that 20% of people paying for Obamacare plans would no longer get government help paying for them. This year's early numbers show a slight 3% rise in Obamacare signups, but the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Administrator Seema Verma says, quote, these reports show that the high price plans on the individual market are unaffordable and forcing unsubsidized middle class consumers to drop coverage. That's a different reality than the one President Obama promised. If you like your health care plan, you'll be able to keep your health care plan. Democrats believe pricier plans are a product of a Republican-led majority with their priorities backwards. We watched their GIP tax bill uh, scam for the rich and rich 
Republican donors, wealthy shareholders, and Wall Street, reward big corporations of shipping American jobs overseas and driving up health care costs for hardworking Americans. The most popular option on the government-run marketplace is the silver plan, and there are 13 states where premiums for silver plans are already at least 40 percent higher this year than last year, including Senator John Barrasso's Wyoming. We had lots of ranchers in Wyoming that had insurance they could afford and work for them, but it was made illegal by, by the Obamacare regulations that said, no, no, it's not good enough for the government. Experts say that when premiums double or triple, the quality of care doesn't double or triple as well. On average, $4,000, and the networks are getting narrower, and they exclude the best doctors and the best hospitals. Control of Congress could be determined by these rising health insurance premiums, or at least by which party voters blame for the price tag going up, because the next round of premium increases will be announced right before the midterms. John? Peter Ducey. Thanks, Peter. Public employees can no longer be forced to pay union dues as a condition of employment. The Supreme Court made that ruling last week, but getting that word out to employees might not be easy. Correspondent Dan Springer reports on a place where one organization is running into difficulty informing employees of their rights. Today.com. Before the ink was even dry on the Supreme Court ruling barring public sector unions from automatically collecting fees from workers who do not join their membership, libertarian groups were outside government office buildings spreading the word. Have you heard the good news about workers' rights? The Freedom Foundation in Washington State has waged this battle before. Several years ago, it won a smaller but similar ruling in state court. Four years later, it still has not been able to reach all affected workers because the unions have blocked access to personal contact information. With a quarter million government union workers potentially impacted by last week's Janus ruling, outreach is in overdrive. We're planning a, a, an all of the above, you know, comprehensive educational uh, program to reach those public employees. According to UnionStats.com, most of the fallout will be in the Northeast and along the West Coast, where there are no right-to-work laws. While nationally just a third of government workers belong to unions, the penetration is much higher in blue coastal states. And that's where organized labor called for rallies, blasting the court ruling and vowing to only get stronger. This was one of the dumbest things they could possibly do. It will absolutely energize the public sector and the private sector unions in this country. And you, you will see a resurgence. Unions are also waging an information campaign, selling members on the value of staying and paying. Some are more convinced than others. Those people who say they have no voice, the union is the bulwark. It is the foundation of democracy in this country. I have a voice. They have to win me back. And, um, you know, and they're welcome to win me back if they're going to be bipartisan. According to the Center for Responsive Politics, in the 2016 election cycle, public sector unions spent over $64 million, and 90% of it went to Democrats. Losing union fees means losing clout. John? Dan Springer in Seattle. Thanks. Canada is making a renewed push to get a new trade deal with the U.S. and Mexico. Canada's foreign minister says she has spoken with U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer six times last week and wants to kick NAFTA talks into high gear this summer. However, President Trump told our colleague Maria Bartiromo that he is holding out until after the fall's midterm election to get a better deal for the U.S. We are continuing to watch the stage in West Virginia, where the president is expected to speak shortly. While we await his remarks, we discuss his choice to interview a sitting senator for the next Supreme Court justice. Our panel weighs in on the likelihood of Senator Mike Lee of Utah being named. That's next. I think the person that is chosen will be outstanding. The main thing the president is looking for uh, are people that fit uh, the, the, the qualifications that you would want in a Supreme Court justice. Uh, tremendous intellect, someone who will stick to upholding the Constitution, and somebody who has great judicial temperament. 
So the suspense continues to build as we await the president's nomination for the Supreme Court to replace the retiring Justice Anthony Kennedy, a nomination that we expect will be announced on Monday. At least that's what the president says. We learned this illuminating bit of information from the White House today. Raj Shah, the president's deputy spokesperson, says the president spoke to three potential Supreme Court nominees today. And that's where it ended. Let's bring in our panel. Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist. Mara Liason, national political correspondent at National Public Radio. And Katie Pavlich, news editor at townhall.com. Molly, it's fascinating to watch Republicans or conservatives who are most vocal about these nominees, you know, trying to either rally behind one or maybe squelch the opportunities right. the that list some that, have. The list that Donald Trump put forth, which he sounds like he's going to stick with, even though he interviewed Mike Lee, uh, it was a list that really garnered a lot of support for Donald Trump in the election. And, and him sticking to it is probably very key. But within that list, even though everyone is going to be largely an originalist on questions of the Constitution and a textualist on questions of the law, there will be some discrepancy. And you can look at it just in the in the form of the most uh, the two most recent Republican nominated justices. You have a man like Roberts who cares a great deal about the perception of the court and what the what the reputation of the court will be. Someone like Gorsuch cares a great deal about the Constitution and fidelity to the Constitution and a belief that uh, failure to, to live according to the boundaries of the Constitution has caused a lot of problems. So within this, you know, these are all people who are largely somewhat the same in their, in their judicial approach. You're going to see some variation and that is interesting and we just have to wait to see who gets picked by We Monday. know that uh, Senator Mike Lee was spoken to by the President today. Would the president put him on the Supreme Court? I just based on all of the chatter, I'd put him low on the list. I'd put uh, Amy Barrett or Brett Kavanaugh up, Kavanaugh up at the, towards the top. There are a lot of Republicans and conservatives who think it would be a good idea to pick a women, woman, uh, not only for the confirmation battle to come, but also if you are going to start undermining or chipping away at Roe versus Wade good to have a woman on the yeah, court. Senator Dianne Feinstein made it pretty clear, Katie, that she didn't think much of Amy Barrett when she was uh, uh, interviewing her for the appeals court. Yeah, uh, not even court didn't hearing. think Why? much, but was very disrespectful, Why? saying that the dogma was running high with her and that she had very serious concerns about that. Look, the left for decades has used Roe v. Wade as really a red herring to be against any nominee that Republicans put up. It's especially going to be bad when it comes to President Trump and who he chooses. When you look at the list of people and the people he's interviewed, he says he likes all of them. He's clearly very heavily weighing all of their different qualifications. And when it comes down to this fight, as the White House has acknowledged earlier this week by reassigning Raj Shah to lead the communications effort on that front, this is going to be a fight that the left um, decides to come at with emotion. And Republicans and conservatives who are interested in the long-term ramifications of who the nominee is going to be, what they do think about the Constitution, what they do think about things like Roe v. Wade and other Supreme Court precedent. They are coming at this from an academic standpoint and a long-term debate. They are not going to come at this with emotion as we've seen senators like Diane Feinstein do and of course all of these left interest groups, including the media, quite frankly, over the last week. Let me just take a pause from this discussion to mention that uh, the West Virginia Governor Jim Justice is getting ready to introduce the president. He is going to be speaking at that dinner at the Greenbrier Resort. When the president does take to the podium, we are going to take you there live and we'll hear whether he might say something about uh, his Supreme Court nominee. Um, the, 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 the confirmation of Neil Gorsuch was maybe touch and go, but a lot of Democrats felt that this was a conservative replacing a conservative Antonin Scalia. Does that suggest that the, uh, the fight to replace, oh, I'm told that the president is standing up. We will uh, we'll have to wait for that answer. Here's President Trump um, getting ready to speak at the Greenbri Greenbrier Resort. This is the salute to service dinner, thanking those who serve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. That is a great gentleman. And he's a big man, isn't he? He's a big man, Big Jim. And thank you to Kathy very much. It's, a, it's an honor. Please sit down. Thank you very much. West Virginia is truly blessed to have someone like 
the governor and wonderful first lady. And I just want to say that I love this state, which I happen to win by 42 points over a Democrat. 42 points. That's like one of these genius golfers winning by nine. You know, it's like the, the same thing. But I want to thank everybody. I've spent the last three days interviewing and thinking about Supreme Court justice as such an important decision. And we're going to give you a great one. We're going to announce it on Monday. And I think you'll be very impressed. These are very talented people, brilliant people, and I think you're going to really love it, like Justice Gorsuch. Uh, we, uh, we hit a home run there, and we're going to hit a home run here. And uh, step by step, we are making America great again. So Jim asked me to do this. I mean, you know, he did switch from Democrat to Republican. You don't see that often. So it's hard for me to say, no, I'm not coming. I said, I'm coming, Jim. And it's a beautiful place. And I watch these tournaments. I have such respect for these golfers, these great talent that nobody knows how good they are. They're really talented athletes. But we're gathered here on the eve of the 4th of July to celebrate the courageous men and women who make freedom possible, our brave service members, and our wonderful veterans. So we love our veterans. Love our veterans. For 242 years, it's a long time, American independence has endured because of the sweat, blood, and sacrifice of the American armed forces. We be, uh, yeah, you probably have been here, and we may air, add a little thing called Space Force. We have Air Force, Space Force. I don't know if anybody wants to hear that, but we're thinking very seriously about it because space is becoming very important militarily as well as other reasons. But it's the greatest force for peace and justice in the history of the world. During both the Civil War and the World War II, the Greenbrier served as a hospital for wounded soldiers, so it's so appropriate. Tonight at the Greenbrier's first annual Salute to Service dinner, we're calling upon this rich history, and we're carrying on the PGA's proud legacy of supporting America's heroes. Joining us for tonight's ceremony are many incredible golfers who will be competing at the Greenbrier this week, and I'll be sitting home at the White House, and I'll be watching and saying, I wish I could play like that. <laughs> Among those with us, I just said hello to a few of them. Bubba Watson, he's having a good year. Where's Bubba? Where is he? Boy, Bubba, he is having a good year. Thank you, Bubba. Keegan Bradley. Hey, Keegan, great. Thanks, Keegan. Thanks. Thanks, Keegan. That putter's working. I just said that shorter putter's okay. <laughs> A uh, longest hitter I've ever seen, Big John Daly. John? John? Boy, he's... John, I played with John in a tournament that we won, meaning that he won. He won. You know, it's funny. He won, and then I go back. Everyone said, how'd you do? I won. Right, John? He's something. And Phil Mickelson. Phil, I'll tell you. I'll never forget. I was at, this is, I don't think Phil can remember this, but like 15, where's Phil? Where is that guy? He's so incredible. Uh, but it was about 15 years ago, and I was Donald. And I'm watching, and the place is packed with people, and Phil's there, and he sees me, and I've liked Phil, and Phil, I think, likes me. And he's on the third hole, and it's a big deal, a big tournament. And he said, oh, excuse me, just a second. And he gets up, hits a ball. It was a three-wood. He hits a three-wood, like 280, right down the middle. Then he comes back, okay, good, so how's everything else? And I said, that really is special talent. That's the office, Phil, right? That's just the office. So. It's really amazing. What a great career. What a great gentleman. I also want to thank Jim Nance for leading this evening's program. Jim, wherever you may be. Where's Jim? Does a great, great job. Hi, Jim. Great job, Jim. Really good. And Slugger White, he keeps everybody honest, right? Where's Slugger? Slugger has done a fantastic job. Nobody plays games with Slugger. I know at Durrell, I tried to move the T's back, and I, he couldn't, he just wouldn't let me do it. 
There was no doubt about it, right, Slugger? Slugger's great. And all of the PGA officials, tournament staff, and the volunteers for their incredibly hard work in putting this really incredible event together. And the job that Jim Justice has done with the course is really spectacular. Also with us this evening is acting VA secretary who's doing a phenomenal job at the Veterans Administration, Peter O'Rourke. Peter? Peter? Good job, Peter. Done a lot of work at the VA, along with West Virginia Senator Shelley Moore Capito, who's a good golfer, by the way. <laughs> Shelley, good golfer, Shelley. And Congressman Alex Mooney and Morgan Griffith. Where are they? Great. Thanks, fellas. Tremendous help to me getting things passed. You think it's easy in Congress? Not easy. So I have to great — if I didn't introduce them as an example today, they'd never vote for me again. That'd be the end of your taxes. That would be the end of everything. I also want to thank our great Attorney General from West Virginia, Patrick Morrissey, who is uh, fighting a great race, Patrick. And congratulations to Patrick, running for the U.S. Senate. And he is a tough, strong guy. And he ran an incredible race against some very talented people, and he won. And now he's got another race, and it's going to be — I see the polls have it very close. Uh, you may be surprised to see what's going to happen. He's got incredible energy, incredible strength, and he loves the people of West Virginia, like, a lot. So good luck, Patrick. We're proud of you. Great job. <laughs> Speaker Tim Armstead and Majority Whip Carol Miller. I want to thank you very much for being here. And, Carol, good luck in the race. I know you're going to do well. I know you're going to do well. And we're honored to have with us the Adjutant General of West Virginia, Major General James Hoyer of the National Guard. The big cheese. Thank you. Thank you, General. Thank you very much. Tomorrow, families across our nation will gather to celebrate the Fourth of July, as we do. We will think of the men and women serving overseas as this very moment far away, far, far away from their families, protecting America and watching over our people. They are there, and they are with us, and they are brave. These are incredible people. And we will thank God for blessing us with these unbelievable heroes. To everyone here tonight who has served our nation in uniform, Will you please stand so we can express our gratitude? Please stand. Please. <laughs> Tough cookies. Tough cookies. And you know, when it comes to ICE and Border Patrol and all of these incredible people that you've been reading about who are doing an unreal job. We want border security. We want security in our country. We respect ICE. You know, ICE is the one. These are tough people. And you have to be tough. And when they have a problem with MS-13 gangs and all of these others that came in through these horrible and weak immigration laws that Shelley was strengthening up, we're going to get them done. We need tough laws. We need fair laws. But when these people come into our country and come in illegally, and then they're dispersed throughout the country, and all of a sudden you see nests of MS-13, you know, it's like you're liberating towns. We send ICE in. And for ICE, it's just another day like Phil and John and Keegan, all of the guys, and Bubba, like the way they play golf. They go, they play. They don't know. It's hard. They don't know what that is. These guys, they walk into those areas. They take them out of there so fast. They're not afraid of anything. It is. It's like you're liberating a town. Like in a war, you're liberating a town or an area. And ice goes in there, and they go in there, and sometimes they have to go in swinging. They don't mind. They're tough. And then I hear Democrats saying, 
We want to abandon ICE. We want to abandon. We're not abandoning ICE, and we're not abandoning our law enforcement. Just the opposite. So I want to recognize today a legendary hero from West Virginia, a veteran who fought in Iwo Jima. In February of 1945, he volunteered to dash straight into enemy fire to destroy vital enemy fortifications and to clear a path for American forces to continue forward. He went right into the machine gun nests. John Daly wouldn't do that, and he's a pretty tough guy. John, would you do that? I don't think so. Definitely hurt your golf game, John. That's the end of golf. In the face of bullets and bayonets, he risked his life for his brothers in arms. And he earned the Congressional Medal of Honor. Today, Woody Williams is 94 years old. He has dedicated his life to supporting Gold Star families and building memorials to honor our fallen service members. In 2016, thousands were moved by Woody's patriotic words when he spoke at one of our rallies in West Virginia. He was incredible. I still remember it. And of course, we all remember that wonderful moment when Woody flipped the coin at this year's Super Bowl. Woody, you are a national treasure, and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Woody, where is, where is Woody? Where is Woody? Thank you, Woody. Thank you, Woody. Brave man, 94. I give uh, a lot of uh, congressional medals of honor. When I say a lot, probably five so far. And it's really one of my, my greatest honors to do it. The Congressional Medal of Honor. It's our highest honor, Woody. Fantastic. So often I'm giving them posthumously where they're just not around. But we hear the stories, and their families are there, and everyone's proud. Uh, but every once in a while, we have one that can be given to people that are living like you, Woody. So thank you very much. We're also deeply moved and honored to be joined by a Gold Star spouse who knows the true price of freedom, Christine Pusteri. Christine's husband, Chris, was a sergeant in the Army's 82nd Airborne Division. Great group. Chris was killed in action in Iraq in 2005. Christine, tonight we send the love and gratitude of our entire nation. Your husband was a special man. We will hold you and your precious family in our hearts forever. Christine, where are you? Christine. Christine, thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Christine. And Christine, through your husband's heroic sacrifice, you understand that he has achieved immortality. And our debt to him and to you is eternal and everlasting. Thank you very much. Thank you, darling. From Bunker Hill to the beaches of Normandy and the jungles of Vietnam, Americans in every generation have given their last breath, their last measure of love, and their final moments on this earth in defense of their country and their countrymen. Our service members have fulfilled their duty to America a million times over. Now we must fulfill our sacred duty to them. We must protect those who protect us. When our service members are in uniform, it is our obligation to ensure that they have the finest equipment, the finest training, care, resources, better than any military on Earth. And when our service members return to civilian life as veterans, we must ensure they have access to the best care, treatment, and support in the world. We are restoring American security by rebuilding our great military. We have secured this year, with the help of Shelley and your great congressman, a record 
$700 billion for our military, and next year, $716 billion, most amount ever. We're rebuilding our military. And when have we needed it more, outside of wars themselves? When? Think about it.